Welcome to this webinar section of the Copyright Module of Academic Law, Policy, and Resources. My name is Sarah Morehouse, and I'm a librarian at Empire State College. When I first started here, I knew very little about copyright, but being a copyright specialist was on my job description, so I had to teach myself. Over the years, I've learned a lot about the law itself, legal interpretations of the law, and its applications in higher education, both online and traditional. I am not a legal expert, and I can't offer legal advice, but I can tell you what the law says and how it is implemented as a best practice. Our topics are what is copyright, public domain, fair use, educational use, the TEACH Act, licenses, the DMCA, and your copyright as a faculty member. So for our first topic, what is copyright? Copyright is a form of intellectual property that protects ideas as they are uniquely expressed by authors. The raw facts and ideas cannot be copyrighted, but what can be copyrighted is the expression of those ideas and facts with any element of the author's creativity. And that kind of creativity can be anything from creating characters in a universe from scratch, to making an analysis or interpretation, to something as basic as organizing data into a table or a diagram. The important thing is that there is some element of the author's own creativity, however small. So a list of ingredients is not copyrightable. However, a recipe with the cook's opinions on the best way to create the food expressed in their own words is copyrightable. Another key factor is that in order for a work to be copyrightable, it has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. There's no definition of what constitutes a tangible medium of expression. However, it has been established that writing something down, even on a paper napkin, counts as a tangible medium of expression. Sending something as an email or posting it to a blog counts as fixing it in a tangible medium of expression. Any kind of recording counts as a tangible medium of expression. However, merely thinking something up or expressing it only verbally or in person through performance does not count as fixing it in a tangible medium of expression unless it's recorded. What seems to be the important thing here is that there's some way for the information to be transmitted from the creator to another person without the creators being there to share it directly. There's got to be some way for the idea to leave a semi-permanent mark on the world. So if you've got your entire novel plotted out and told everyone everything about it, but it's only in your head, that's not copyrightable. But if you wrote it in a notebook and hid it away, that's automatically copyrighted. There's been a misunderstanding that in order for something to be copyrighted, you had to register the copyright. That's not true. A work of original authorship is copyrighted as soon as it's fixed in its tangible medium of expression. This means that anything you find on the internet is copyrighted unless it's in the public domain. By default, copyright belongs to the creator of the work. Copyright law uses the word author, but it's important to remember that it's not just the textual medium that can be copyrighted. Any way that an idea can be fixed in a tangible medium of expression can be copyrighted. For copyright purposes, an author is defined as someone who contributes ideas and expression to the work. If a person contributes ideas but not expression, or they don't contribute ideas to the work, then they can be considered a collaborator or a contributor but not an author, and they don't share in the copyright. Copyright is a kind of intellectual property, and property is transferable. Copyright can be transferred in part in the form of a license, or in whole as in a sale part of an inheritance, or very commonly as the condition of a publication contract. So the copyright of many published works, including books and articles, often is owned by the publisher and not the author. In a work-for-hire situation, a contractor or employee authors a work on behalf of another individual or organization who employs them, and the employer owns the work. In the SUNY context, Faculty who create academic materials and write as part of their scholarly work own the copyright of their work. It is not a work for hire. However, staff who are creating non-academic materials as part of their job description are creating works for hire, which are owned by their institution. Copyright is associated with the tagline, All Rights Reserved. 
What rights are those that are reserved by copyright? They are 1. The right to make copies. 2. The right to distribute copies, whether for a fee or not. 3. The right to make derivative works, which I will talk about later, and to make and distribute copies of the derivative works. And 4. The right to assign the copyright to someone else, whether as a license or a transfer. So what is a derivative work? First, let's define it in contrast to a copy. A copy is merely a duplication, another instance of the original work. You can copy through traditional media by handwriting it, Xeroxing, tape recording, videotaping, or taking a photograph. You can also copy through digital media. Saving and printing create copies. Whenever you post something to the public web, you're creating infinite copies. So a derivative work is more than creating a copy. It's making changes to that copy, or making another work that is based on the original. Types of derivative works are spin-offs, supplemental materials, sequels, translations, adaptations, and conversions to a new format. In the academic context, some common types of derivative works that you might find would be a quiz based off a case study, a translation of a poem, a study guide to a novel, or covering a song with a different time signature or key. All of these derivative works are just as protected by copyright as the original work upon which they're based. There was a prominent court case several years back in which J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter novels, took some fans to court for trying to publish the Encyclopedia of the Harry Potter universe. The Encyclopedia was entirely their own writing. However, it was a derivative work of her novels. The court found that, as the copyright owner of the Harry Potter novels, she owned not only the copyright to those novels, but also the copyright to any derivative works that might be based on them. Our next topic is the public domain. Works that are in the public domain are not protected by copyright. That means that you don't need to ask permission to copy it or create a derivative work, and you don't need to pay royalties. Usually a work is in the public domain because it has aged out of copyright. Copyright has a finite duration. Anything published in the U.S. 1922 or earlier is in the public domain. For most of Europe, anything before 1890 is a safe bet. Later than that, there's no quick way to know how long any particular work will stay in copyright, because the law has kept changing, and as it changes, older works are grandfathered in under the older laws. In addition, different countries have different copyright term limits. For works that are published now, and since 1976 in the United States, here are the rules. If the work has one or more named authors, you take the date that the last author dies, go to December 31st of that year, and add 70 years. They call this life plus 70. For published anonymous works and corporate works, which means works that were authored by an organization or business, you take the date of publication and add 95 years. For unpublished anonymous or corporate works, you take the creation date and add 120 years. If you can't determine the date, you're obligated to assume that it was the last possible date on which it could have been created based on the circumstantial evidence. Copyright law assumes that if something is unpublished, it should be protected more strongly than if it were published. Copyright terms didn't used to be this long. There are a number of works published in the middle of the 20th century that may be in the public domain, or may be impossible to, to determine without extensive and expensive research. But long story short, for a work to be in the public domain, it usually has to be very old. One major exception is that publications of the United States federal government and its agencies are automatically in the public domain from the moment of creation. Because public domain is so tricky, I created a tool using Google Forms that walks you through finding out whether something is in the public domain. It won't always give you a concrete answer. Sometimes with those mid-century works, 
whose authors may or may not have renewed their copyright back when those things were required, you may actually have to pay for somebody at the Library of Congress, or another country's equivalent, to go through the records. But for most other situations, if you know the country in which the work was published, and the original publication date, and you can see whether it has any copyright statement on the back of the title page, you will be able to figure out whether the work is in the public domain yet. At the end of this presentation, I will provide the link to this and every other tool that I use in the presentation. Our next topic is fair use. Fair use is an aspect of copyright law that is unique to the United States. And while it's sort of vague, ambiguous, and its interpretations are sometimes contentious, it's also extremely lenient and useful for academia. Fair use is the part of copyright law that actually says that some things are more important than copyright, and therefore, in some cases, what would ordinarily be considered a violation of copyright is permitted. Those things that are considered more important than defending the author's profits and control over their works are scholarship, research, education, news reporting, criticism, and commentary. Because of how copyright works, when you use the fair use exemption, you are using some of the rights that are reserved to the author, and you may be taken to court for it. Fair use is what you call your affirmative defense. Yes, Your Honor, I did that thing, and I'm arguing that I shouldn't be sued or punished for it. This sounds inherently risky, but it's done all the time, and it is necessary for a healthy society and the progress of knowledge. Don't be afraid to use fair use. Just don't stretch it too far. Whether or not what you did was fair use is decided on the basis of what are called the four factors. When deciding whether what you're doing is fair use, you're supposed to decide based on all four of the factors equally. An extremely good case for one of the four factors will not override an extremely bad case for another one of the four factors, and vice versa. In practice, however, you'll see that the first and fourth factors are the most critical, and the other two mostly just fit into them. The first factor is the purpose of the use. The purposes that are considered good or favorable are ones that reflect the justification for fair use, that they benefit society and the progress of knowledge through education, research, scholarship, news reporting, criticism, and commentary. Also included and backed up by many court decisions is the right to make a single copy for your own personal use. Commercial purposes are considered extremely unfavorable for fair use. Sadly, art and creativity are not considered especially favorable, but they're not considered unfavorable either. Skipping to the fourth factor, because it's the other really critical factor, is that it's the effect on the market for the original work and also for derivative works. You can see why this is a critical factor. Profits may not technically be the most important thing in the eyes of the law but they are what motivates authors and publishers to send their lawyers after you. If your use has no effect on the market for the original work or the derivative work, that's favorable. You can diminish your effect on the market by doing things like limiting the audience or making it impossible for your use to serve as a substitute for the original. If your use does somehow impact the market for the original work or its derivatives, that's extremely unfavorable. Now back to the second factor, which is the nature and character of the work being used. It is considered favorable for the second factor to use nonfiction, non-artistic works. Our copyright law assumes that more of the author's creativity and originality goes into fictional, artistic, and dramatic works than into the reporting and analysis of facts, and therefore they have a stronger need for protection. It is not necessarily unfavorable to use a fictional, artistic, or dramatic work, but it won't help your case either. Another aspect of the nature and character of the work being used is whether it was published or unpublished. It is considered favorable to use a published work. 
using an unpublished work is not a deal breaker, but it is not favorable. The justification for this is, as I've mentioned, copyright law is more strict about protecting the rights of authors who did not formally publish their work, because formal publication is usually the avenue through which authors protect their right to be compensated and control the way their works are being used. On to the third factor, which is the amount and substantiality of the portion used. Here, there is no cut and dry amount or percentage. The goal is to use the smallest amount that you can. If you are using a selection of the work that can stand alone, or enough of it that it can stand alone, then it is extremely unfavorable. That points back to the fourth factor, impact on the market for the original work. If you are taking a large part, or the main part, or even just a crucial part of the work, it might serve as a market substitution and cut into the sales and licenses of the original. So you don't have to be extremely favorable on all four factors to justify fair use, but you definitely need to avoid being extremely unfavorable on the first or the fourth. There's a famous court case that shows how serious the courts are about the fact that it's not just the amount, but also the substantiality of what's being used. Back in the 1970s, someone wrote a biography of former President Gerald Ford, and there was a pre-publication review of it that quoted a few sentences from it. Normally, a book review is a textbook case of fair use because it counts as criticism and commentary, and normally, a few sentences of a book-length work is easily justified under fair use. But this time, the author of the biography sued the reviewer for copyright infringement, and the author won. The reason was that those particular sentences that they quoted were the heart and soul of the work. They were the spoiler for the book, and quite possibly the only reason most people would buy a biography of Gerald Ford, because those sentences explained Ford's rationale for pardoning Richard Nixon for Watergate. So as you can see, it's not just how much you use, but also how important it is to the integrity and uniqueness of the work that it's taken from, and how well it can stand alone. Because fair use is so complicated, I've created a tool to help you make the decision whether something you want to do will count as fair use. It's not like the public domain helper that I showed you before, in that it won't actually tell you whether something is fair use. But what it will do is walk you through the process of checking the pluses and minuses of all the four factors. It also serves as documentation of your good faith effort, which is very important if you ever get taken to court in a copyright lawsuit. It's just a Microsoft Word document with check boxes and spaces to write in your own words. But it does break down the decision-making process into something manageable. So this is a Word document that you download. It's in protected mode. When you switch it to edit, all you can do is fill out the little forms and put checks in the boxes and things like that. I'm just going to run through it really, really quickly, skipping over some parts so you can get an idea of how it works. So as you can see, the point of this isn't that it's an exact science. The point of this is to think it through and also to have documentation that you thought it through. There are some types of fair use that have been established in the federal and supreme courts and therefore count as a sort of shortcut automatic fair use without having to go through the four factors. One of these is a transformative work. We talked about derivative works which are works that are somehow altered from or based upon an original copyrighted work. A transformative work takes that one step further so that it becomes its own original work with its own completely different purpose from the copyrighted work that influenced or contributed to it. A transformative work can't be mistaken for the original, 
and it can't be used as a substitute for the original. Examples of transformative works in higher education include taking a video or an image and adding a subtitle explanation or a voiceover commentary, or putting thumbnail images into a timeline. Some things that we do commonly in higher education that would definitely not count as transformative works would be translating a work, revising it, or putting it into a new format. Another thing that's very important is that using a song as background music in a video is never counted as a transformative work, probably because it is so easy to strip the mp3 out of the video and use it as a substitute for buying the song. Another form of automatic fair use that takes place in the library all the time is a single copy for personal use. It is completely legal to download or print something from a library database or website. It is also completely legal to make photocopies of articles and book chapters from their print version. However, if you are systematically copying huge parts of a work instead of purchasing it, or making multiple copies to hand out to a classroom full of students semester after semester, then it becomes more doubtful whether it's fair use. It is a gray area, and the question is, how systematic is it? And how reasonable would it be in the real world to expect a person or institution to purchase or license it instead? Classroom handouts are something that is done under the fair use exemption. However, they aren't unconditionally protected by fair use. If you find yourself handing out entire articles and book chapters to the students in your course, the same articles and chapters, semester after semester, then that counts as systematic copying, which is not covered under fair use. Fair use is more appropriate to use when you are copying excerpts of an article or a chapter, or copying something ad hoc or on the fly for your students to read. Otherwise, it's more appropriate to order a course pack, or put the items on reserve or electronic reserves, because those arrangements allow for the licensing of material. For visual resources or something short like a poem, you can put it up on a screen, even read it out loud, because performance and display are much less restricted in a face-to-face -face classroom setting, which is something we will talk about shortly. And if the material is available through your library's online resources, a good solution is to put a permalink to the article or chapter in your online syllabus and require students to bring their own copy to class, which would count as a single copy for personal use. Online students are already used to having to do this for themselves, and face-to-face -face students can adapt. Our next topic is educational use. When we say educational use, what we mean is a face-to-face -face classroom, because this part of the law was written back in the 1970s. In the context of a face-to-face -face classroom environment, for strictly educational purposes, there are no limitations on the performance and display of copyrighted work. So the limitations in terms of educational purposes are basically that it has to be something to do with your curriculum and your learning objectives. It can't be anything for extracurricular activities, faculty development, conferences, staff meetings, or anything else. And the limitations in terms of performance and display are basically that it can be putting images or art or text up on a screen, playing recordings including documentaries, movies, TV shows, commercials, film strips, or anything like that. They can be playing audio recordings of music, oral histories, or anything of that sort. It can also be live performances, whether musical, dramatic, poetry readings, dance. There are no limits as long as it's just performance and display. So educational use does not cover making or distributing copies or derivative works. The advantage here is that you do not have to make a clip or excerpts of what you want to use in the classroom for performance and display. You can show, play back, or perform the entire work as long as it's for purposes that are connected to your learning objectives and done in the context of a face-to-face -face classroom. Next, we'll talk about the TEACH Act. The TEACH Act is the somewhat more restrictive analog of the educational use exemption for the online learning context. The TEACH Act is also somewhat unique in that it applies to some colleges and universities, but not others. The way the law is written, the institution has to meet certain criteria, and if they do meet the criteria, then they can take advantage of the provisions of the TEACH Act. The best way to find out if your institution is TEACH Act compliant is to ask your copyright office or your library. If your institution is TEACH Act compliant, 
then it works sort of like a more restrictive educational use exemption, except it's for online learning inside the LMS. So just like educational use, the TEACH Act allows performance and display of copyrighted materials like images and audio and video files, but it doesn't allow making derivative works or distributing readings. When you use a piece of multimedia under the auspices of the TEACH Act, there are some restrictions. First, your institution has to be TEACH Act compliant. Second, the material has to be legally obtained and legally acquired. You can't use a pirated copy or a bootleg. If there is a born digital copy of the material, you need to acquire that. But if there is no born digital version, then it's okay to digitize your traditional media copy. Now that you have your digital multimedia that you want to put online, it's important to remember that you can only use it in the LMS, inside a particular course, so that it's only available to the students enrolled in that course for that term. If your institution offers something like a streaming media server, you should make use of that, because it provides an additional layer of protection against downloading by the students. You can't post it online, in e-reserves, or in email. You also can't keep an online library or archive of multimedia that you frequently use. The course itself has to provide a statement about copyright law, and the multimedia that you embed needs to be marked with the fact that it's copyrighted, and citation information so that the copyright owner can be identified. Within those guidelines, if it is a non-fiction or non-dramatic work, you can embed the entire thing. If it is a fictional, dramatic, or otherwise artistic work, then you can embed as much of it as you need, but no more. This goes back to what we talked about earlier, where U.S. copyright law protects creative works more strenuously than factual works. I want to clarify that when I use the word embed in this context, I mean that you have possession of a file, which you either put on your institution's streaming server or upload it directly into the course itself. Services like YouTube and SlideShare provide what they call embed codes. That is a different kind of embedding, and for copyright purposes, a YouTube or SlideShare embed code counts as linking, not copying, so you don't have to worry about the copyright. Our next topic is licenses. One type of license that you'll often work with indirectly are the library licenses. Part of each institution's tuition dollars goes toward paying for library subscriptions to online resources. In exchange for our money, the vendors license us to access their content within their specified restrictions. One of those restrictions is that libraries are not permitted to allow access to their databases to anyone who is not current faculty, staff, or student of the institution. Sometimes a database's license permits things like embedding an article or image in an online course, or using it in a conference presentation or a publication. Other times, those things are forbidden. If you want to know what a particular database license allows and prohibits, ask one of the librarians at your institution. Another kind of license that you'll encounter is the kind that you get when you get permission to use copyrighted materials in one of your publications, in a conference presentation, or in a course when any of the copyright exemptions don't apply. When you have a course pack made up, your students will pay not only for the printing, but also for the copyright permissions, which the print shop will handle. When you have copyrighted material placed on e-reserves, and it's not covered by fair use, the library typically handles copyright licensing or getting permission for those materials. If you want to upload copyrighted material to the LMS, and it's not covered by the TEACH Act or fair use, then your institution may have a copyright office that either handles it or helps you do it. In this case, the cost of getting permission may be paid for through the copyright office or through your academic department. It's a good idea to find out how this works at your institution well before you actually need to seek permission. If you have to get permission to use copyrighted materials yourself, it can seem like quite an undertaking. You should make sure that you have plenty of lead time. Several months is ideal. If you're trying to get permission to use textual material that was published fairly recently and in English, 
then the first place to check is the Copyright Clearance Center. The Copyright Clearance Center is a for-profit corporation that aggregates contact information and boilerplate licenses to use these materials, so that you can search for a particular work, select the kind of use that you want, and in many cases, just give them your credit card and pay for the license right there. In other cases, the Copyright Clearance Center will put you in touch with the copyright owner, and you'll have to negotiate a license yourself. For other kinds of material, you often have to research to find out who the copyright owner is. This can be somewhat challenging for out-of-print materials, music, movies, and TV. Check with your institution's copyright office, or if they don't have one, check with your library for help with this kind of research. Once you have identified the copyright owner, then you need to negotiate a license. Technically, this can be done verbally. However, it's only common sense that you need to get it in writing. It doesn't matter if it's writing on paper or via email. In fact, many copyright owners have an online form through which you solicit a license. If there is no online form for you to fill out, then you will have to send the copyright owner a letter and a proposed license for them to sign and return. You should specify which work you're using, as well as how much of that work, and which parts of that work. Page numbers or timestamps are essential. You should specify what you're using the work for. Mention that it's educational. Name the course and specify the learning objectives that you're tying this work to. Specify for how long this work will be available and how big the potential audience will be. Specify how you're protecting the work from additional copying, such as a classroom with only 20 students in it, or if it's in a course in the LMS, and password protected. All of these things have the potential to make the copyright owner feel more secure in granting you a license, and possibly at a lower cost than they might for non-educational purposes, or for an unrestricted audience. If you do need to seek copyright permission yourself, I've created the Getting Permission Subject Guide with instructions for how to identify and locate the copyright owner of the work that you want to use, and also a sample letter and license for you to work off of. Here's what it looks like. Getting permission to use copyrighted materials is not always cheap. For permission to use published articles and books for the non-fictional market, expect to pay about 35 cents per page per student. That can add up quickly. Permission to use big media content such as movies, TV, and music can be prohibitively expensive and sometimes they just won't grant you permission at all. Things that are produced for the educational market specifically, like textbooks, workbooks, and educational films, also tend to be very expensive. And if you're trying to license them instead of purchasing them through the conventional means, they may not allow it because they want you to use the market that they've already established. Finally, permission to use unpublished web materials can be tricky. Sometimes it's granted for free or very cheap because it's educational. Other times you can't even contact the copyright owner, and so you can't obtain permission at all. Next I want to talk about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA. The DMCA was passed in 1998 as a way to update copyright law to account for computers and the Internet, and the way they made illicit copying cheap, fast, and easy. It created heavy penalties for Internet service providers who permitted copyright violation using their equipment and services. And it also made it very illegal to bypass things like password protection and encryption. The DMCA anti-circumvention provision is the part that prohibits attempting to break or bypass user access control or copy protection. You are not allowed to do this even if the content behind the access controls or copy protection is something that you are allowed to access, and what you want to do with it is something that the law would otherwise allow you to do. For example, fair use allows you to make a single copy for personal use of any movie that you've purchased. However, if your DVD is encrypted to pre prevent you from making a copy, you are not allowed to break or bypass the encryption to make your copy. There are only a few exceptions to this, and they are highly specific. Within the educational setting, the Disability Services Office can break encryption 
in order to make ebooks accessible for blind people, and film studies professors can break encryption to make compilations of clips from DVDs. Notice that both of these exceptions allow specific categories of people to break encryption under specific circumstances. It is never allowed to break access controls, in other words, passwords, and other forms of authentication. So one provision of the DMCA that is relevant in an educational setting is the safe harbor provision. Under the DMCA, each college and university counts as an internet service provider because it provides email and network access to faculty, staff, and students. Before the DMCA, it was unclear whether internet service providers such as colleges would be held liable if their users used their equipment and services to infringe copyright. The DMCA allows internet service providers shelter from such liability in exchange for acting as sort of copyright police for the federal government. In other words, the IT departments of our institutions have to comply with the DMCA takedown procedures, or else if any faculty, staff, or student violates copyright, not only is that individual sued and facing criminal penalties, but the whole institution is. What this means is that any copyright owner or their designated agent may approach the college's copyright officer, who is usually an IT administrator, and make a claim that their copyrighted content is being infringed somewhere in the college's web space or LMS. This statement has to contain particular pieces of information to identify the copyrighted work and where the alleged infringement is taking place, and it is called a takedown notice. When the copyright officer of the college receives a DMCA takedown notice, he or she is obligated to immediately remove the allegedly infringing content, which, because of the need for immediate action, means that the entire course or website is taken down. There is no due process in this procedure, and there is no investigation before the takedown happens. The professor of the online course or the website administrator is not notified beforehand. Once the allegedly infringing material and the entire course or website surrounding it has been taken down, the person responsible for that content has two options. The low-risk option is to remove the allegedly infringing content and then ask for the website or course to be put back up. If you go with this option, there will be no further action. You will not be sued or face a criminal trial. However, if you know that the content is not infringing, you are within your rights to issue what is called a putback notice. This is a counterclaim, and when you issue it, you put your course or web page back up with the allegedly infringing content still in it. If you go with this option, the copyright owner has 14 days to file a lawsuit against you in federal court. If you're ever going to go with the putback option, you need to contact a lawyer first. Another thing to take into consideration is that the DMCA requires that the Internet Service Provider terminate network and email access to anyone who repeatedly violates copyright. In the modern academic context, it is hard to imagine being deprived of network and email access and still being able to do your job. So effectively, if you violate copyright repeatedly, the DMCA means that you can't keep your job. On the bright side, the DMCA does not require the copyright officer seek out and expose copyright infringement, and it doesn't require anyone to inform on anyone else. The best way to stay safe under the DMCA is to maintain a collegial and safe atmosphere in which faculty, staff, and students feel free to ask for and give help and feedback about copyright issues in their courses. The last topic I want to talk about is your copyright, the copyright you own in anything that you publish and in the academic content that you produce. The SUNY Board of Trustees has determined that faculty and professional staff own the academic materials that they create in the course of their employment. It is not a work for hire. It doesn't matter if the academic materials that you create are for traditional face-to-face -face courses or for online distance learning courses. You own the material, and therefore you can use it as you wish, you can restrict others' use of it, 
and you can license and sell it. You can teach with it at another institution. You can put it under a Creative Commons license. This does intersect with your employment contract. So if you have questions about whether you may legitimately prevent another faculty member at your institution from using your materials, or whether you may legitimately sell your academic materials to another institution, it would be best to ask a UUP representative. Not everything that a SUNY employee creates is their own copyright. Classified staff do not appear to own the copyright in the works that they create in the course of their employment. Those are works for hire. Additionally, if you create works that can't be construed as academic content, for example, developing web copy or promotional materials, those count as works for hire. Finally, if you develop academic materials under a letter of agreement, what you are doing is accepting a lump sum of money in exchange for developing content that the institution will own. This does count as a work for hire. You should check the wording of the letter of agreement because it may specify whether you are permitted to use it at another institution. And finally, the scholarship and writing that you produce while you are employed by a SUNY institution is your own copyright. The only people that you might share authorship with are your co-authors. And as we said before, co-authors are people who contributed not only ideas but also the expression of those ideas. It is very important at this point to make the distinction between copyright and other forms of intellectual property, such as patents. The SUNY Board of Trustees treats patents very differently than copyright because the institution claims a share of the profits from patents that are created using institutional time and resources. No such share of your copyright is claimed, even if you researched and wrote using institutional time and resources. Thank you for bearing with me through this massive information dump. You will not be quizzed on this content. No one expects you to remember it all. There is a frequently asked questions on Empire State College's copyright information website, whose link is displaying on this slide, which is a good way to prod your memory later if you need to. Please also visit the subjectguides.esc.edu slash CPD copyright link displayed on the slide where you will be able to access a clean video recording, the slides, the script, and all of the resources that